leading in worship, the opportunity to take us to the throne of God in music. But music is one avenue of worship. There's all kinds of different avenues of how we can worship God. And I do appreciate the avenue of music in order to worship God. But there's all kinds of different avenues in which we can worship God in. And one of those would be prayer or reading or music. Worship is us getting alone with God, having communion with God and ourselves. I like worship. I necessarily like to have that opportunity where we can lead in worship. Because when we lead in worship, if we would take the farmer's analogy would be that the farmer going out into his field after a long winter, and he takes that plow, and that plow is going down, and he cultivates that field. He turns the ground over. He allows the ground to be cultivated in order for the seed to be planted. The ground had to be pliable. And that is what worship does for us. It gets into our hearts and it gets into our lives and allows us to focus on God. So when God does speak the word of God to you, your heart is now pliable that it could take the planted word and it can thrive and it can grow. When we don't worship, I believe sometimes God's word goes on deaf ears because the attitude of worship is one that is not receptive to the very words of God. So when we do worship, when we do open our hearts and when we do open our eyes and say, God, I would like for you to speak to me, it is in the attitude of worship in which God works. If we do not have the right attitude, God sometimes cannot give to you what he wants for you to have for the day. So when we come into a church service and we don't have the proper attitude or worship spirit, and you walk out the door and say, that preacher didn't do very good today. What I'm saying is maybe we weren't prepared for the preacher to do good today because our heart was one that was closed off to the very words of God. So open up our hearts. Allow the worship, allow the, pli- the pliable part of God's word to implant so we can take what God has in store for us. Last week we talked about the 50s. Talking about our church being 58 years of age and and all the things that have taken place in the 50s in order for us to get where we are today. Well, when I was looking at the 60s today, it's kind of ironic how uh, media and uh, my sermon will go together today because uh, on CNN this week, anybody watch CNN this week? It said about the 60s, had a documentary every night about the 60s, about what took place in the 60s. And I was I was born in 1963, so I'm a product of the 60s. Back in 63, I am 51 years of age, and I don't remember anything about the 60s, but when I started looking at the 60s, it started off in a very very weird way. It started off uh, automatically uh, with the Bay of Pigs in 1961, and how the United States became so consumed about nuclear war with the Russians that we were afraid to death. We had commercials about where we should go or what we should do, how to arm ourselves, how to protect ourselves. It was for the very first time since World War II that we were afraid that the world annihilation could take place and we would be at the center of that world annihilation because of Cuba, Russia, and the United States. And you understand the embargo that took place and and how the United States stood ground and Russia turned their ships around and now they started um, taking away their their missiles from Cuba and from Turkey. And now that started changing the entire dynamics about the Cold War. And in 1963, President John F. Kennedy assassinated. Just the next year, Robert Kennedy assassinated in the same three years, Malcolm X and was assassinated. When we look at all of these issues about people that were assassinated, people that made decisions, and our country going in a direction that was really weird, really difficult, how that impacted our life. You know, in 1964, the Beatles were introduced for the very first time. Anybody remember the Beatles? 
1969, Woodstock, three days up in New York City, free love, free sex. We started to talk about what we could do. And the generation back in that day said, I don't want to listen to the man. I want to be who I want to be. I want to do what I want to do. It started a revolution of saying, I don't care about my authority. I care about what I want to do. So in 1960, all the way back, we started thinking about how that impacted our life, whether it's through civil rights or whether it's through religious freedoms, whether it's through birth control that was brought through the FDA in 1964 for the very first time, whether it was Apollo landing on the moon in 1969, whether it was a race with political freedom from Russia, or whether it was Cambodia, whether the killing fields in Cambodia, how all of those issues of the world impacted us today and how we go so far into how can a generation 40 or 50 years ago impact who we are now? How does that take place? We can look at all kinds of different issues. We can look at our generation, the younger generation, or we can look at the older generation and say, well, they shouldn't have allowed or we should have stood up. All kinds of different things have taken place and all the way from the 60s, it changed the very dynamics and the fabric of how we look at our society. Our society has definitely changed from the moment 1960s hit. Now, the 50s weren't perfect, and the 40s weren't great. But when we start talking about Vietnam, we start talking about Russia, we start talking about the Cuba process, we start talking about... Woodstock. We start talking about abortion. We start talking about all kinds of different things that took place in a nine-year period. There was so much in those nine years that they could, I have 12 pages of notes of major events that took place from the 1961 to 1969 and there were pages after pages after pages of major events that took place that had an impact on our society today. There, there was one in here that was so simple. It was, it was uh, Richard Nixon and John F. K. first presidential debate on TV. Anybody remember that? Okay, I don't remember that, but it was their first presidential debate. But here's the difference. John F. K. knew what he was going to do. Richard Nixon didn't think about what he was going to be seen. He cared about what he was going to say. But John F. K., he had, he had makeup on his face. He looked tanned. He looked young. He looked uh, debonair. So when people looked at him, he looked like he was very secure in his ability that he could do what he said he was going to do. Our first social media was back in 1960 against Richard Nixon that came off of an illness, had a five o'clock shadow that looked pale. Here's the difference. Radio said Richard Nixon won the debate. TV said John F. K. won the debate. In other words, Richard Nixon failed to realize the impact of television in his campaign. Whether his message was strong enough wasn't the issue. The issue was perception. The perception is, I'm going to see. Richard Nixon could not see what was going to take place. John F. K. understood that television was the means into the future. It started that. In 1961, the first weather satellite was deployed. Now, how do we have our weather satellites? Now we have GPS. We have everything all up on our satellites. It started back in 1960. The technology grew so fast, we could look at from 1960 to 1965. We are a product of what took place in the early 60s. I look all the way back to 1969. Now, I'm going to ask you, was any of you guys at Woodstock in 1969? Many of you guys would probably raise your hands. But, you know, 1969 Woodstock. It was a three-day adventure, not of rebellion, but of freedom. They had the mindset of this. I have three days away from government intervention, from laws, free drugs, free sex, and freedom from any oppression. For three days, they could do whatever they wanted to do with whatever music they wanted to listen to. And nobody could say no, and nobody did. For three days. 
The older generation looked at that, and they said, they're a bunch of heathen little kids. The younger generation looked at that and said, that older generation do not understand us. From that point, a generation gap has always existed. Music was a key of that generation gap. Now, was it always right? Do, do we believe in the, the drugs, the sex, and the rock and roll and how all that impacted? Whether we believe it or not, whether we, exist, whether we agree with it or not, is not necessarily the issue. The issue, it took place. So when we take what they did in 1969 and we look at how does that impact us today? Spiritually, how does that impact us today? We look at all kinds of different things in the Bible. When you look at Woodstock in 1969 with that free love and that free attitude that I can do whatever I want to do, as a Christian, we can say, you know what? We may be able to do some things, but just because we can, should we? So that's the premise that I want to take from the 1960s, everything that took place from the Vietnam War, from the landing on the moon, from the social media, from all of the stuff that has taken place, the equal rights, the discrimination, and how Lyndon B. Johnson said in Bill, that said there will be no more discrimination. We're going to set an even playing field. So from 1969 to now, we look at three different aspects. Just because I can, should I? Just because I can, should I? I, I probably get this question a couple times a week. Pastor, is it a sin to, you fill in the blank, is it a sin for me to do this? Can I do that? I said, I'm not the, I'm not the sin police. I can tell you what the Bible says, but I'm not going to walk up to the line and tell you that if you do this, that is a sin, or that's a sin, or this is a sin. You know, the bottom line is, is not, is it a sin? A mature believer will say, how far from it can I stand so I don't fall off into sin? Sometimes we walk so close to the edge of sin, I may not sin, but I'm trying to flirt so much that I sure can look at it or I can't play with it, but if it's a slippery slope, I'm sure going to fall into it. How do we take the black and white issues of biblical mandate and fill in the gray areas? And how do we allow the gray areas to work within our lives, not to be condemning, but to be transformed? How do we grow how do we understand? I is not my opinion about whether it is sin. It's God's opinion if it's sin. But if it's a gray area of the Word of God, it is up to you to ask God to give you direction, peace, and understanding in those areas that are not black and white in the Word of God. So I'm going to do that in 20 minutes. Okay, you ready for that? Let's have fun doing that. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. I can, but should I? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So that's found in the New King James. Let me read it to you in the NIV. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. No one should seek their own good, but for the good of others. So, as a believer, we are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're given our life to Christ. We know that we're going to heaven. We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I'm not my own anymore. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. So, I have, I have nailed my life to the cross. I, I know that any longer that I do not have the say about what I do, but what I want to do is I want to honor God in everything that I do. So what is the first question you have to ask? Is it moral? Is it moral? Moral principles and rules are standards of right and wrong based on core values. These moral values come from the number of sources, including society, family, peers, and our theology. It is a moral conduct. The problem is that we live in a fallen world. So the question is, where do we get our moral compass from if we live in a fallen world 
and we have to make decisions about morality, where do we get our moral absolute from? And as a believer, I would say, we must get our moral absolutes from the very word of God. The reality is seen that the fact that, that two-fifths of self-identified Christians say that they, just, they can do whatever they want to do as long as they don't hurt themselves or hit, hurt somebody else in the process. As long as I don't hurt anybody. My sin is my sin. My life is my life. As long as I don't hurt anybody, I will be fine. Well, the Bible says something a little bit different than that. He says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So the depravity of man, all the way back into Genesis, all the way back, God looked into the heart of man and saw that it was evil. They had a, 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 a very depraved heart and a depraved mind. But God gives us some moral attributes. And let me give you those moral attributes of God. The first thing is God is love. In John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God's explanation of himself is, I am love. Now, we would look at when God says, you can't, it's your perspective of who God is. If God says, thou shalt not, is it, God doesn't want me to have fun, or God's trying to keep me from hurt, from pain. But God is love. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 16, it says, Be holy, for I am holy. What is, what is that all about? Holiness. Be ye holy, because I am holy. Be ye like Christ, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God, the Father that created the heavens and the earth. I am holy. I inhabit the praises of my people. Be ye holy holy. What is the holiness? The holiness is the perfection of God. How can we look at God and sin in our life, understanding that God is holy and he desires us to be holy, but yet we still want to play with the sin? And then mercy. In Psalms chapter 103, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Isn't that great? The Lord is merciful and gracious. Although he desires to be holy, he understands our sin, and he desires us to follow after him. But when we do fail, and when we do make a mistake, God says, I am merciful. I want to walk up to you and rescue you. I don't want to throw you under the bus, and I don't want to hurt you. I want to give you mercy and grace. I want to encourage you. I want to help you along the way. You do not have to do something that you can't do on your own. I want to give you mercy. And then his goodness in Psalms chapter 52, verse 1, the goodness of God endures continuously. He's good. Not he's great. He's good. He always is good in everything that he does. He's not doing anything against you. He's not condemning you. He's already given to you eternal life. He's already blessed you. He's already adopted you into his family. God is good all the time. He's good. And then he's gentle. Psalms chapter 18, verse 35. Your gentleness has made me great. The way that he handles us, the way that he ministers to us, the way that he allows us to do certain things he has a very gentle spirit put upon him our life. He says his yoke is easy, and he will make our burdens light. We, we have to understand that he is a gentle nature. And then, but here's where he stands, truth and justice. He understands that God is truth. In Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, chapter 32, verse 4, it says, He is the rock. His word is perfect. For all of his ways are justice, and God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. He is a just God. Just means he is right. God never fails. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, and he never, ever fails. He is a just God. God. He's going to do the right thing every time. When he looks at our life, when he looks at your sin, when he looks at your relationship, and we ask him, what should I do? He's going to look at you and your circumstances and your life and your issues, and he's going to put them all together, and he's going to understand, this is the right thing for you to do because this is what I desire for you. 
I desire you to take the very word of God. I want you to take the moral compass of life, and I want you to understand it's truth and justice. Listen to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praise, think on these things. The Bible says we need to take every thought captive. How do we understand the gray arrow area of the biblical principles? We understand black, we understand white, but that gray area, sometimes we have to look at the moral compass and not necessarily what man thinks or what man agrees with, but what does the Bible say and what is the moral compass of the Word of God? The second thing, not is it moral, but is it legal? Is it legal? Guidelines of morality is given to us by the law. Laws of God and the laws of man. He has given to us and expressed commandments to obey. Something we are to do or to act, we are to avoid. If we are supposed to do something that's against God's word, we should avoid on purpose breaking God's word. If we know it is sin and continue to do it, to them it is sin. So if we absolutely know that God says it is black or it is white, it is sin or it is not sin, we shouldn't have a, I have an idea, I'm going to go talk to somebody, I'm going to get the blessing of the pastor to commit sin. No, if it's black or it's white and it's the word of God, I do not have the authority nor do we have the authority to go against the very words of God. It is law. It is God's word. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. The difference between the Old Testament all the way up to the New Testament started in Matthew. We were under law. Now we are under grace. We have the understanding that Jesus died on the cross, and our new covenant is the grace that Jesus Christ has provided for us. But Jesus died to give to us that grace. He died so we could have eternal life. He gave to us something that we could not have ourselves. We could not have communion with God. So God sent his son to us. So when we look at should I or do I have to obey God? Do I have to obey the very words of God? We have to look at do you want to obey the very person that gave you life, that gave you forgiveness of your sins, that are going to give you eternal destiny in heaven? It is not something that I have to do. I should say, what does the word of God say? And I want to apply that within my life because I honor the one who gave me life. Malachi 3 6 says, For I am the Lord and I do not change. I am God. I was God in Genesis, and I'm going to be God in Revelation. I was here before the foundations of the world began. I'm going to be with you to the foundations of the world's end, and that's eternity. I am. So here it is. God is truth. Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Truth. You shouldn't say a lie. So if that's the case, the truth, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. In other words, he's saying, quit gossiping, quit lying, tell the truth. It got quiet. Colossians 3, 9. Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, there should be a life change. When we were doing something before we gave our life to Christ, and now we've experienced the forgiveness and the love of Christ, we have put off the old man, the old way. We have begun a new life. Here's the issue. We sometimes bring our old life into our new life, and we try to mingle our flesh into our spirit, and we come up with our own religion, our own satisfaction. And as long as we sprinkle a little bit of truth, a little bit of God's word into what I'm trying to do, we can, we can justify our sin because we put Jesus just enough into what he has told us to do or not to do. But the word of God is absolute truth. So we have to understand God is truth. And then God is gentle. God is gentle. Ephesians 4, 32. And you be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be gentle. If something takes place within your life and we're children of God, we have to be tender-hearted. We have to care. We have to have empathy. We have to feel for them. 
We don't have to have my way or the highway. We have to say, what does God want? And if I am going to look at the gray areas in my life, and I, I can do something, I have the right to do something, but yet it's going to hurt somebody that you love or that loves you. What we should look at, it, I need to be tenderhearted towards somebody, evaluating the action that I'm going to perform or the thought that I have to make sure that what I'm going to do is beneficial for us and not just what I want, but what's best for them. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, the book of this law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Joshua is saying, guys, here's, let me give you the, the, the prosperity gospel in a nutshell. Do what God asks you to do. Know the word of God. Live out the principles of the word of God. Then, when you do what God has called you to do, he said right here, for then I will make your way prosperous. I'm going to open up doors that you will have no idea how they got open. I'm going to give you blessings that you have I, no idea how you got those blessings. And it's not because of you. It's because of your faithfulness to God's word. And you say, this is what God said because God said it. I believe it. Because I believe it, I'm going to apply it. And when I apply it, God's going to open up doors. It's very simple. The first thing we have to do is ask, is it legal? In John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Very simple, huh? If you love me, keep my commandments. It doesn't say if you like me. It doesn't say if you come to church and worship me. It doesn't say if you read about me. It doesn't say that if you heard a song about me. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the idea is it all stems out of the condition of the heart. Everything is about the heart. God looks deep within the soul of an individual. We can play the game and we can, we can look the part and we can come to church and we can act like all things are going right. But when God looks at you, he doesn't look at what you're wearing, what you're driving, and where you live. God looks deep within your life and looks at your soul. So is it moral? Is it legal? And then the last question is it ethical? Is it ethical? Ethics are a code of expected behavior that applies in the absence of laws. Situational ethics. You could come up with all kinds of different things and you can say this or this. The law doesn't apply. What is it that I should do if something doesn't apply? If there's no law, if it's something that I could do or something that I should do or something I want to do, but what should I always do? Ethics must be constant with the moral principle of God but entail knowledge of when the situation presents itself, there is a right answer. What is the means to find the right answer when you're talking about ethics? We have to look at the filter of ethics of saying, number one, what does God want? What is my calling in life? How can I help others? And will it hurt me? What is my calling in life? When I look at what the gray areas of the Bible are, I can look at that and say, how can it hurt me? What is it going to do for me? Let's throw, uh, let's throw a hot potato out there, okay? I'd like to throw a couple hot potatoes out there. I don't know, I'm going to get phone calls left and right on this one. Having a beer at lunch, is it a sin? Having a glass of wine with your dinner at night, is it a sin? I would tell you, it's not a sin to have a beer at night. I would say it would be wrong for you if your family had alcohol issues and that beer or that wine could cause damage to your life and to your psyche that it could develop into alcoholism. Nobody becomes an alcohol because of a beer they become an alcoholic because they can't say no to that beer. So what we have to look at, is it right? Is it harmful? Can you or can you not say no to the very thing? It may be a gray area, but for you, that gray area may turn into a black and white area because we do not handle or we cannot have that. Maybe our calling 
isn't ready for that. Maybe we are called to be set apart. Maybe our testimony is going to be one that's going to hurt if we do something of that nature. What we have to do is we have to look at just because it is okay doesn't mean I should. Because sometimes the thing that I can do hurts me more than the things that I should do. And what I can do is I can just say, you know what, it's not for me. I don't necessarily need to do that. I don't necessarily have a desire for that. Because if I look into my future, into my life, I can look at things all day long and say, you know what, my calling or my testimony or the things that I should do or the things that I want to do is more important than my sacrifice or the thing that I'm trying to do. Maybe it's for my kids. Maybe it's for my church. Maybe it's for my spouse. Maybe it's for myself. Maybe I need to look deeper and look at the ethical issue of life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 24, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient or profitable or bring together. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Let everyone look at the other person. Just because you can, just because it's a gray area, doesn't mean it's beneficial to you. What we have to do is we have to look at the ethical side of our decisions. Look at those decisions and evaluate what is it that God has set me aside for? What is it that God has called me to do? I understand black and I understand white. I understand when God says thou shalt not and when God tells us to do something. Those are black and white issues in the word of God and those are easy to explain and I can take those and I can understand exactly what God wants me to do in those areas. And those areas are not necessarily the problems. The problems that we have are the gray areas. Can I? Should I? And then we sprinkle different religions, our histories, our backgrounds, our legalisms, our liberalities, and we look at those things, we sprinkle them all together, and we make up our own simple little doctrine and dogma of Christianity in a nutshell. And we say, I can, because I can. And because that's what I want, that's what I live by. I challenge us. We have to look at the gray areas of life in a more open mindset than we do on what's best for me. We have to look at that as what is best for God? What is best for God? Just because he didn't put it down in black and white that thou shalt not, or just because he said you had to, he gave to us the spirit of God that works within our life and gives to us insight and understanding to the things that are be beneficial to us and to our calling so we can be set apart. In Romans chapter 14, Verses uh, 13 through 14, it says, For none of us live to himself, but no one dies to himself. Therefore, let no one judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block of a cause to fall in a brother's way. I know and I am convinced that the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean in of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food or your sin. You are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy the food of one of whom Christ died. He's talking about food, eating food that was offered to idols. And sometimes it was a stumbling block to a, to a culture or to an individual. And he said, it's not a sin. He said, but even if it's not a sin, if it's going to cause somebody else not to have a relationship with me, don't enjoy the food that's not a sin in just allowing someone to stumble because of what is right for you. Evaluate the process. Look at what's taking place. Look at who you're around. Evaluate black. Evaluate white. Look at the gray areas, the non-essentials, gray areas of the Word of God, and say, is it legal? Is it ethical? Is it moral? Is it okay? Because here's the issue. Zacchaeus, we all know the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was what? A wee little man. And he, Jesus comes walking around. And Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus. So what do you have to do? Climb up, eh? Oh, you guys are good in children's school. 
He climbed up in a sycamore tree. Why did Zacchaeus climb up in a sycamore tree? So he could see Jesus pass by. Why did Jesus, why did Zacchaeus have to climb up the sycamore tree? Because what? Because people were in front of him. The tree was there as a vehicle to see Jesus. But the reason why Jesus, the reason why Zacchaeus had to climb the sycamore tree is because people were standing between him and Jesus. And there's times that we, me and you, are standing between me and Jesus. And sometimes they can't see Christ. Now, is it our fault that we're standing there looking at Jesus? No. We love Jesus. We worship Jesus. We want to raise our hands and we want to honor Jesus all day long. But there's sometimes people, we little people, that are standing behind us trying to get through to see Jesus. And we're living our life, we're doing our thing, we're playing our life, and people are trying to get to Jesus. And they can't. They'll do whatever they can to see Jesus. The application is, are we a hindrance for people to see Christ? If we are a hindrance for people that we love to see Christ, if we are doing something that we want to do, but it's keeping somebody from seeing Christ or being around Christ, I would tell you at the end of your life, when Jesus looks at you and said, well done, thy good and faithful servant, in your life, you didn't do anything wrong, but what you did, you kept somebody else for seeing Christ. I had to bring a whole different dynamics. I had to put a tree up here. I had to move this around. They had to get out of this situation. They had to move around. I had to make them climb a tree, do something different so they could see Christ because you were in the way. I had to make a new way. Is that a hamburger? I had to make a new way to get to Christ. So what we have to do is we have to back away. We have to look at the influence that I have we have to allow those that are behind me to look at, if it is a gray area of the Word of God, stop. You don't have to be right. You can take a break, and you can look around, and you can say, you know what? These people, I may be a stumbling block. I am going to say no, because I want to say yes to them. It may not be in every situation. It may be situational, but we must start looking around and look at the gray areas of life and understand, sometimes I should just back off. I should ask God, what is the purpose of my life? What do you want me to do? What is the purpose with my kids? I understand the gray areas. I understand the hot topics. I understand what the Bible says about this and what the Bible says about that. And I understand people have different opinions about every different issue. I understand that. But let's be honest with God and say, that's a gray area, Lord. I need you to teach me. I need you to open my eyes and give me revelation about something and allow that revelation to apply within my life and learn to grow about the gray areas of life. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are honest, think on these things. Sometimes what we have to do is we have to just say, Lord, I don't know everything. I don't know what I should do. And I don't necessarily know what you want me to do. But I know that you live within my heart and you live within my soul. And I know that you will direct me. You'll open up the doors. You'll give me peace and you'll give me understanding. If you convict me about my sin, if you control me, I will be willing to lay down my life, lay down my sin and open up a door of opportunity. I want you to teach me the gray areas. What do I do? What do I do about the things that I don't know to be absolute truth? That's when God is going to take you from a babe in Christ to a growing, mature believer in Christ when we're willing to say the gray areas is where I'm going to learn. That's what I'm going to do. Just because I should, or just because I could, doesn't mean I should. And when we look at why I shouldn't, there has to be a bigger purpose. Not because I don't want to. It's because we have to look around. You have not been saved 
for yourself. You've been saved to glorify God. You've been saved to bring others up to see Christ. We have a bigger purpose in our life than our self-gratification. The bigger purpose in our life is to God, God's glorification to reaching other people to his salvation, to bring honor to him. That is why we're called. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, I pray you'll be with us today. And uh, Lord, be with our hearts as it is intended to share. We agree with the word of God. We believe that you are the absolute truth, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. We understand that you're immutable, that you do not change. We understand that you are given to us salvation by grace and grace alone. We understand that there's none of us going to heaven except for the power and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We understand that every one of us must make a decision for you. But we understand that the redemption plan of this world that Jesus Christ gave to us is to reach each and every person for the cause of Jesus Christ. So when we look at what you have done for us and then we look at what we are doing, I pray that the two match. I pray that when we know that what we are doing could be a gray area of our life, that we will ask you, we will plead with you to open up our hearts and open up our lives to let us see what we are doing. Is it right? Is it wrong? Can we do something different? Can I communicate the truth? Lord, give to us peace. Give to us understanding. Give to us enlightenment where we need it. And Lord, more than anything else, give to us direction. Let us know, without a doubt, what the gray area is that I struggle with. And give to us peace and strength and grace in those areas. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.